last few decades, Asia has experienced rapid economic growth, political transformation and social change. This is a familiar and well-worn narrative. The story of cyberspace in Asia has been less frequently explored. But before we go into it, a disclaimer. Talking generally about Asian cyber policy is always going to be fraught with problems. Asia is hugely diverse. When you include the Pacific, the region comprises over 60% of the world's population and 40% of the world's internet users. 3,500 different languages are spoken here. It is a region marked by stark economic inequalities, both between countries and within countries. Asia is home to some of the most networked societies on Earth and the least. States within the region exercise dramatically varying levels of control over their citizens. On the global stage, they may have very different ideas about what key cyber policy issues even mean. And in some policy areas, approaches are notably less coordinated than in other regions. Increasingly, Asia is a crucial battleground for the future of the internet. Major norm-setting developments on freedom of expression and cybersecurity are happening here. And it plays host to many competing visions of cyberspace, from China's Great Firewall to ambitious connectivity and e-governance schemes like Digital India. In this video, we can't pretend to capture everything. Instead, we want to give human rights defenders a basic grounding in the cyber policy landscape in Asia, where key policy issues are being discussed, and how civil society and other actors can engage effectively in these debates. In Asia, cyber policy discussions are dominated by perceived threats to security, whether that's national security or economic security. Let's look at the national security first. Increasingly, territorial disputes are spilling over into cyberspace. In 2012, a tense naval standoff between the Philippines and China saw hackers on both sides defacing each other's websites. In 2014, China's deployment of an oil rig in contested waters with Vietnam was accompanied by cyber attacks on Vietnamese websites. Tensions on the Korean peninsula are increasingly playing out online. As a former Indian National Security Minister noted in 2015, Cyberspace has become a fresh domain of contention between states. It is true of land, seas, skies and outer space, all of which we have successfully militarized. Exactly the same thing is happening in cyberspace. Another key area of concern is economic security. In 2011, malicious attacks against Hong Kong exchanges and clearing caused the suspension of shares for seven companies with a combined worth of $167 billion. And in 2014, MT Gox, the world's leading Bitcoin exchange based in Japan, went bankrupt after the theft of $460 million by hackers. The cause? Security breaches. A recent white paper presents a mixed picture of cyber vulnerability in the region. Most Asian countries, including China and India, were found to be less vulnerable to cyber attacks than the global average, but a few were found to be much more vulnerable. In response to security concerns, countries across the region are trying to develop stronger cybersecurity frameworks and measures and increase their cyber capabilities. According to the ITU, nine countries in the region have adopted cybersecurity strategies, and at least three others are in the process of developing them. A lot of new legislation is also being introduced. In 2014, Pakistan updated its 130-year-old surveillance and interception law with the Investigation for Fair Trial Act, with the stated aim of regulating advanced and modern investigative techniques. And in response to fears that other states might be exploiting geospatial data, India has introduced a draft bill which would place heavy restrictions on unauthorized digital maps of its territory. But while often introduced in the name of cybersecurity, in some cases these new laws threaten to undermine human rights by introducing new surveillance measures and imposing controls on content. Human rights defenders are resisting this trend. In the Philippines, for example, a clause in the 2012 Cybercrime Prevention Act, which criminalized libel, was struck down after a campaign against it. The same activists then used crowdsourcing to draft a new bill called the Magna Carta for Philippine Internet Freedom, in direct opposition to the law. And in India, an often misused section of the Information Technology Act, which criminalized the sending of offensive or annoying messages over the internet, was struck down after sustained public protest. In some states in Asia, 
Human rights, like the right to freedom of expression and the right to information, aren't always universally applied. Often, archaic definitions of blasphemy, hate speech or sedition can be used to repress them. For example, when violent riots broke out in Pakistan over a video perceived as blasphemous, the government responded by shutting down YouTube, citing blasphemy laws under the Pakistan Penal Code. And in Malaysia, news websites that have exposed government scandals have been banned on the grounds that they threaten public order and national security. Another challenge to human rights defenders in the region is measures which undermine privacy. For instance, Thailand's government has been seeking to restrict website encryption to address content which could result in public disturbance. If successful, these measures could significantly increase the scope of surveillance and have a chilling effect on activists and journalists. There are also some positive moves towards harmonizing data security laws with global standards. In Singapore and Malaysia, privacy laws are currently being implemented. China's consumer protection law is being updated to include data privacy principles. A task force to study right-to-be-forgotten reforms in South Korea has been set up, and at the regional level, a framework for privacy has been drafted by Asia-Pacific Economic Cooperation members. For human rights defenders, the obvious first point of engagement is the national level, where cyber policies, laws and frameworks have the greatest impact. As we've seen in the cases of India and the Philippines, human rights defenders can engage effectively at the legislative level, either by working with legislators or by challenging decisions in national courts. National cybersecurity strategies are another potential way in. These already exist in several countries in Asia, but are missing or still in development in others. Human rights defenders should follow the development of these strategies closely and ask questions. Does the strategy have a specific mechanism for stakeholder engagement? And what portion of the budget has been allocated for cybersecurity? But cyber issues don't respect national borders. Addressing them requires coordination at the regional and global level with the involvement of different stakeholder groups. In Asia, regional cooperation takes many forms and varies depending on which part of the region you're looking at. In South Asia, coordination tends to be done through bilateral and multilateral channels. It remains one of the least integrated parts of the world, despite the existence of regional bodies. By contrast, East Asian regional cooperation has grown stronger over time and mainly centres on the Association of Southeast Asian Nations, or ASEAN, a political and economic organisation of 10 Southeast Asian countries. Unlike its African and Latin American counterparts, it doesn't have a court. But through its regional forum, efforts have been made to build a framework for addressing criminal and terrorist activity in cyberspace. Another influential regional force is the Shanghai Cooperation Organization, a Eurasian military, political and economic association of six states, with India and Pakistan soon to join. This is a state-dominated space, but an important one for cyber policy, with cybersecurity high on their agenda. Bodies dealing with technical issues are another important part of the landscape. The Asia-Pacific Network and Information Center, or APNIC, is one of the world's five regional internet registries. It provides forums for internet policy development, which human rights defenders can get involved in. And out of the many non-binding forums in the region, the Asia-Pacific Regional Internet Governance Forum is a place where human rights defenders can learn about emerging cyber policy issues, exchange best practice, and develop collaborations with other stakeholders. But what about forums at the global level, like the ITU, the London Process, and the UN Group of Governmental Experts? Outcomes of discussions in these forums can have big implications for regional and national approaches and policies in Asia. While they aren't necessarily binding in the way that national laws are, these discussions can set the norms which shape the wider cyber policy environment. But the reverse applies too. Regional initiatives like the Wuzhen Summit aim to project regional norms onto the global level. We said at the start of this video that generalizations about cyber policy in Asia would be unwise. There's no one right way to engage as a human rights defender. These structures and forums are complex. What works in one might not in another. But we hope that this video at least provides a starting point for a bigger conversation. Music